fight at all. Mm -hmm. When we all went all the way down to Atlanta from Kentucky to vote for him. So just as a reminder for me that this was an important moment. And there he is in his confidence. This is after he had said, like I said to you, I don't think I said this to you, like I said to Graham, that I'll be the first president of Savannah. He's coming out of court. And as you can see out there, there are policemen and all kinds of people behind him. And he's in his dashing, confident way, before he was arrested, he was saying that we'll overcome. And then I have John Lennon. Here it is, my grandfather, who was Nelson Mandela's teacher, with me. And here is Albi Sachs, who is another hero of mine who worked with Mandela, my grandfather, and all those generations. So I don't forget these people in my life. So when the day is really bad, I ask myself, how bad can it get? It can't get worse than it used to be. So these are the people who inspire me. So, so I don't know what you photographers want to do, but I just think it's important to have. I'm swallowing my camera. Yeah. Well, like I told you when I started, apartheid was, it literally meant exclusion. Okay. And as I said, I don't know where I said this, apartheid was the extreme form of bullying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm using the terms that students you said that on the NPR yeah. right now. Yeah. Oh, no wonder they, uh, they wanted to go to New York to talk about this. John Jacobs and all this whole stuff in New York. New York <laughs> you can't with me. Um, <laughs> um, so, if you are raised, in my home, I, I was raised with common folk mm -hmm. in a village with people who didn't go to school, not because they didn't want to, because they couldn't afford to go to school, there were no schools for them. And women in particular whose husbands were working 10 hours away from their homes, and they could only come home for three weeks a year for vacation. So our home was the post office, it was the church, it was also our home. So everybody was welcome to come to the house. My father used to bring mail from the town, which was seven miles away. And our jobs as we were going to school was to be educated enough to be able to read and write letters for the people. So you grow up under that consciousness that sense of service, that sense of duty as a child. And the first white person who came to visit at my home, first time I saw a real white person interact with me was when I was about 11 or so. I didn't have a, a white teacher as a teacher for me until I was 15. And that was in high school, which was seven miles away from the town. So when you grow with this separation of people, and the suffering of people, this exclusion. It's only natural. There was nothing, there's nothing else to aspire to be that other than to be someone who can bring people together and help to improve the lot of the people. So that's where my activism started. Just trying to find a way to be inclusive. Of course, by then, my grandfather had been arrested. He and his brother, Mm -hmm. Joe Matthews and Z.K. Matthews were the only two father-son pair who were arrested with Mandela and charged with treason triumph in 1956. And all the details of that are in my grandmother's book. And then my grandfather was also arrested in what was called state of emergency, where he was in solitary confinement and he was just... So he, all these things that happened to someone I called Papa, who was my grandfather who used to come and visit us and we couldn't see him. So combine the sense and the plight of the people you grew up with and what is happening to your family. I don't care who you are. You're going to be conscientized, you're going to be politicized. So all my brothers were politicized. All of us became politicized. That way. So once you're politicized, you're either part of the solution or you're part of the problem or you just sit back. Mm -hmm. I want to be part of creating the solution which is why I became that. So arrest became, um, actually, it became a, 
a signal for being involved. Okay. You know, um, not that we wanted to be, but rather than going out of being interrogated like Mandela was in there, you were the best suit and you go out in confidence and with a smile. Because people are going to be encouraged when they see that you are still as hopeful, they have not defeated your spirit. Oh, I see. And even the students in 1976, which was my generation, as they were killing people, young people, who were seeing that all of time, teach, tell Bother to release Mandela so he can come and release, so, so he can come and lead us. So that was the rallying cry of the people, of young people, because the time when the tide turned was when young people became involved, high school children became involved. The first high school child to be killed in Soweto in 1976 was 13, Hector Peterson. There's that great picture of Hector Peterson being held by a guy wearing coveralls who ended up being someone I went to school with, that was an iconic photograph. So that was the struggle. You know, nobody anywhere wants to be kept down in a country where you have the majority and it's your own country. And someone comes from outside and they take you out of your house and they'll say, you're going to live in the toilet without running water. You will not come to the place that belongs to your forebears. That will conscientize them to my Release Mandela and all these campaigns that started in Europe actually, and before they came to the US, you know, they're all about releasing Mandela. So, in, in the song, they're asking, they're not asking, they're demanding, demanding Oliver Tambo to uh, work with. No, no, they're asking Oliver Tambo, you're right, asking Oliver Tambo to demand yeah. that both release Mandela so that Mandela could release us. I see, okay, okay. It's a bit more metaphorical, he was exiled. He was in exile, but you know what? They were singing both in exile and, and also in, inside. They were, were singing the same songs, mm -hmm. both inside South Africa and outside South Africa. This quote comes from what you were saying before, you know, why are people singing? There are so many songs, you know. When Mandela is buried on uh, Sunday, I know the song they're going to sing. Mm -hmm. It's going to be Hamba Gashem Konto. Hamba it's going to be like, go well, spear of the nation. They're going to sing that song as his coffin is going down. So because we were not allowed to write anything, people were banned, we were not allowed to speak, we used song. That's why song is so well developed. That's why people are singing everything. I see. So strangers are looking at that and wondering, what is going on? Why are they celebrating so much? They're expressing themselves. I President Clinton better join the song. Right. I hope someone is teaching them the song on their flight back to South Africa. Yeah. yeah. And you said that, you know, the, the, your family members started to become arrested and then you, it was a sign for you to get involved. And by that time, how old were you? Oh, I couldn't even say it was a sign for me to be involved. I remember writing a letter writing letters to my grandfather when I was, oh gosh, I was seven years old. Wow. And by then he could not come to South Africa. He was in Geneva. Asking him why he was not coming to see us. He, he was in jail? He was in Geneva. Geneva, okay. Yeah, the World Council was at the World Council of Churches. And when my grandfather died, I remember just wanting to write a letter to somebody. I remember writing a letter to Nelson Mandela with no, and I just, Nelson Mandela wrote an island. People used to just write things and he put it in the mail. Mm -hmm. That's when I realized I was becoming a militant. Just, they won't know it's from me. They just write the letter to Nelson Mandela. We're waiting for you to come back and lead us. And we just take the letter, go to the post office, look around, put it in the mail. Address, Robin Island. Of course, I never got the letters. So it was not just. There's nothing heroic about me, to tell you the truth. Absolutely nothing. I just happen to have been born under the circumstances where you and anyone else could have done the same thing. Yes, what does this death do to, you know, the people's psyche in a good or bad way? Or, um... This is going to unite people more than ever. Okay. 
there will be nine to five years worth of lessons from Mandela that will keep that country together. Mm -hmm. You watch. Mm -hmm. Black and white, Indian, everybody is going to be united. There will be pitfalls. I mean, how often do you get a Mandela? Maybe once every thousand years? We don't have a Mandela, but we have a little sleeve of Mandela in each one of us. We have to try to bring them together. Only great people sometimes become famous after that. Or people don't necessarily realize how great the person is. And they don't necessarily succeed in the organization. What made Mandela such a good leader, not in terms of just his quality, but also you know, in a practical way? Like, why he was such a good leader? Well, he was raised in a village. Mm. I'm very biased. I think people are raised in circumstances where they are taught humility from the moment they are born. Mm. And they are taught to be inclusive, not to be selfish, to be kind. Um, and they have many parents rather than just one parent. The so-called, it takes a village. Mm. A different person comes. We are now moving away from that, even in South Africa. We are getting our kids raised by just one, not even two parents, by one parent. Some people have no choice, mm -hmm. but it would be great for communities to get together and say that child there is not being raised by one parent, we are all raising that child. That's why schools are becoming very, very important places to raise children. Because all of us are raising these children. Mm -hmm. They would not have so many people looking I would not be teaching, I would not be a teacher, I would not be at Gordon School if I were not an optimist person. I'm mm -hmm. very optimistic and I think the roles of optimism are found in education, especially in residential education. Mm -hmm. I know that not everyone can get that chance in a residential setting, but I'm optimistic. It is a responsibility of all those who have an opportunity in schools like this to be ready to lead when called upon to lead. And I'm not saying to be ready to be leaders, because you have to be called upon to be a leader. You can't just decide, I am a leader because I went to graduate school. It starts with being humble. Mm -hmm. But our job as faculty is to get them ready to be in a position to step up when they are asked to step up. Embrace them. They will embrace me, I will embrace them. They will embrace my family, we will embrace them. It's embraceable growth for me. It's not just growth. Everybody belongs. Mm -hmm. And when you give them that message, people understand. Everybody matters. Staff, faculty, students, uh, and mm -hmm. parents. We embrace neighbors. Mm -hmm. We have to be neighborly neighbors. And so um, I like the fact that we're still living with that idea. And we start in a very special way. We start with silence mm -hmm. in the chapel. Mm -hmm. You hear a lot of things.